Okay, good evening, everyone. We're going to begin on page 175. 175. So today's lesson, we're going to talk about a, uh, a great leader, namely Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses. And we're going to talk about how he did something that was, call it uncharacteristic or unusual, and uh, how we can learn from him how we can behave in our lives as well. So we're going to open up with, in the Parsha this week, we read about two very tragic deaths, two very uh, colossal losses for the Jewish people. Miriam is one. Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, is the first one. And then Aaron himself, the older brother of Moshe Rabbeinu, also passes in this week's Parsha. So both leaders in their own right, Miriam the prophetess, Miriam, and Aaron the Kohen God of the high priest, both held very prominent roles in the Jewish people. Miriam was a great leader for all of the Jewish women, as we see explicitly in the Torah when it came to singing the song post splitting of the sea. It was Miriam who led the women in song. She was the one who was the leader for the women. So we all know from two weeks ago, reading in the Torah and from history, that Jewish people spend 40 years in the desert. If you are going to spend 40 years in the desert, what are you going to take with you? Pack. Number one, water. Very good. Number two, a tent. Food. Number three, a tent. Very good. After, if you have, wo if you have water, food, and a tent, you could be, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. So the Jewish people spend 40 years in the desert. We need to have water, food, and a tent. We need to have this in order to survive. In this week's parsha, we read that the Jewish people didn't have water. If you're in a desert without water, what are you going to do? What do they do? A classic Jew. What do they do? Hit the rock. They don't hit the rock. They complain. <laughs> complaining. Where's the water? Come on, no. The kid is just one minute late. Why is there no cholin? Why is there no kugel? Where they complain? Right? So let's read from the Parsha this week, text number 1A. Shalom, take it away. The entire congregation of the children of Israel arrived at the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people settled in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. The congregation had no water, so they assembled against Moses and Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses and they said, if only we had died with the death of our brothers before God. Why have you brought the congregation of God to this desert so that we and our livestock should die there? Why have you taken us out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place for seeds or for fig trees, grapevines or pomegranate trees, and there is no water to drink. Moses and Aaron moved away from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and they fell on their faces. Then the glory of God appeared to them. Well, in the history, in the reading of the Torah, this comes like in the middle of the story. We've been in the desert for a long time already. So what happened now we don't have water? What happened all of a sudden? So continue 1B. Had no water. From here we learned that all 40 years, the well was available to the Jewish people in Miriam's merit. So we learned something fascinating that Rashi quotes from previous sources. The Jewish people had a well, a traveling well, a miraculous traveling well. This was called what we refer to as the Be'er of Miriam, the well of Miriam. Why was it known as the well of Miriam? Because when Miriam died, the well stopped giving water, which meant clearly was a clear indication that the reason why we had the well was in the merit of Miriam. If Miriam is no longer here, no more water for the Jews. Now that Miriam dies, no more water. The Jews have a problem. They complain. We need water. They come crying to Moshe Rabbeinu, and Moshe Rabbeinu does the 
famous or infamous move of taking his staff. God tells him to take your staff and speak to the rock, and he takes his staff and he strikes the rock. And the next thing you know, Moshe Rabbeinu is water comes, but Moses is punished that he will not merit to enter into the land of Israel. But that's not going to be the focus. We're not going to be talking about the striking of the rock today. That's going to be left for a different time. Let's pause for a moment. And let's go to another item that on our list, if you're going to be spending time in the desert, and that was shelter. The shelter. Where did we get the shelter from? Where did we get our tent from? So it was a, it was a protected let's cloud. Read in text. Cloud oh, protection. very good. We had clouds. We had a clouds of protection. Very, very but good. also they built huts. They also built huts and they built so, like like booths, you know, like like let's, let's see, let's see, let's see. Text number two A. Simon. They traveled to Kad for Kadesh, and the entire congregation of the children of Israel arrived at Mount Hor. God spoke to Moses and Aaron from at Mount Hor on the border of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered to his people. You shall not come to the land which I have given the children of Israel, because you divide my word and the forms of the speech. Take Aaron and Eliezer, his son, and ascend Mount Hor. Strip Aaron of his garments, and dress Eliezer, his son, with them. Then Aaron shall be gathered in, in to his people and die there. Moses did as God commanded him. They ascended Mount Hor in the presence of the entire congregation. So Aaron dies. What happens immediately after that? Text two may continue. The Canaanite king of Arad, who lived to the south, heard that Israel had come by the route of the spies, and he waged war against Israel and took them down for captive. So the Talmud asks, but Ishmael Knani and the Canaanite king of Arad heard. What did he hear? The Talmud answers, continue text to see. The Canaanite king of Arad who lived in the south, heard. What report did he hear? He heard that Aaron had died, and that the clouds of glory had withdrawn from the Jewish people. And he thought that he had been granted permission to wage war against the Jewish people. And this is as, as it is written. And all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, and they wept for Aaron thirty days, all the house of Israel. And thus, Rabbi Abahu said, do not read the verse as, and they saw the evil. Rather, read it as, as they were seen by Yerau, by others, because the cover of the clouds of glory had been removed. So for context, we generally, when we say we need shade, we need a tent, we need to say, why? Because to protect us from the heat, from the sun. That's what we need, right? But there's also another element of why you need to have protection. And that's not only from the sun. We need to have protection from all enemies, foreign and domestic, as they would say. So if you're living in a desert, you have wild animals, you have dangerous animals, and you also have uh, foreign enemies that may come and attack you. So the Jewish people needed protection. And these clouds of glory provided protection for them. Now, this is clearly told to us in the Mechilta text number three, where it says like this, the Egyptians steeped in darkness saw Israel in light, eating, drinking, and rejoicing. And they shot arrows and projectiles upon them, and the cloud and the angel protected them. So we see that we had two critical elements in the desert. One was the well, and one were the clouds of glory, right? So we know what happens. The well disappears or stops providing water. The well dries up. And what do the Jewish people do? Immediately, what do we do? Complain. Complain. The clouds of glory, the clouds of protection, we'll call them, disappear. And what's the reaction? Where's the complaint? How come there's no complaining now? When it came to the water being gone, ooh. When it came to the clouds of protection gone, no one opened their mouth. No one said a word. No complaining. But they, they were okay with being attacked now. They were okay with being vulnerable now. How do we make sense of this? So this is the question we're going to address. Why no outcry? Why no response from the Jewish people when the clouds are gone, but a massive response when the water is gone? Seemingly, okay, you may say water is more vital immediately, but 
if you're in the desert, you need to have that protection. They, they would never survive without the protection. So if they were Jews and we know the pattern, they should have been complaining. That's the, that's the way it should have gone. Now, let's understand by addressing or introducing the holiday of Sukkot. So we have a holiday. The holiday is called the holiday of Sukkot, which is a time when we are commanded to leave our homes and to dwell in temporary huts, temporary uh, 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 makeshift homes, what we call today a sukkah. Why do we eat outside of our home? Why, do we, why are we to move, to move out of our permanent residence and to a temporary little dwelling out in the, in the, out, in the outdoors, which has to be uh, um, um, organic to the elements, why are we doing this? Is the mitzvah in the Torah? Well, does God give us a reason for this mitzvah? The answer is yes. Text number 4a, Yaakov. So that your ensuing generations should know that I had the children of Israel live in booths when I took them out of the land of Egypt. I am Hashem, your God. So God took us out of Egypt and gave us what? Booths. What's this, what's this meaning of booths? What did God give us? What is the meaning of booths? Continue, 4b. I had the children of Israel live in booths. These were the clouds of glory. So it means that God gave us one big booth. He put us all into a booth. This was a booth of protection. And to remember this forever, God says, I want the Jewish people to live in a booth for a few days. Go out and live in a hut. Live in a sukkah. Why? Because when you left Egypt, I put you in a sukkah. Which is why a sukkah at its most, uh, at its, in its best form, has four walls and four sides and a covering. You can get away with less. But at its best, it's four walls from four sides and a covering. Text number five, what of David? The cloud of God was above them. Seven clouds are recorded in the account of their travels. Four from the four sides, one above, one below, and one in front of them that would flatten the high land, raise the hollows, and destroy snakes and scorpions. So we have the first time mentioned about the clouds was when, we, when God tells about the holiday of Sukkot. We have another mention in the book of Numbers about the clouds. This is in reference to what of David what? What's this in reference to? Traveling. When the Jewish people would travel, these clouds, the Torah mentions clearly that you had these clouds. One would go in front of them and they would and it would uh, flatten the high land and it would kill the snakes and the scorpions. We have another mention of the cloud, and that is text number six A. And that when Amalek attacked the Jewish people when we left Egypt. So Moshe Rabbeinu calls all in Yeshua and says, go get an army together. And go out and fight with Amalek. Go out from where? What do you mean go out and fight him? He was attacking us. Where are you going to? So Rashi says in 6b, go out of the cloud and fight him. In other words, you had to, the, the cloud was like the border of the camp. You had to go outside of the camp in order to fight him. But when you look carefully, and you analyze all of these various mentions. So text 4b spoke of the holiday of Sukkot, and that uses the term, not clouds, what, is, what, what term does he use? What term does Rashi use? Moon. No, no, 4b, what did Rashi say? Clouds of glory. Oh. Uses the words hakot, anane kovot, the clouds of glory, right? But in the other references in the context of the cloud lifting for travel and about going to wage war against Amalek, where do we have, do we find the word glory there or just the cloud? Just the cloud, the word glory is not there. So the question is, are clouds of glory and clouds the same thing? Or are we referring to two different things? So the Rebbe suggests an innovation, a chidush, a novel idea in Trutu Shel Mikra, in the simple reading, in the Pirush Rashi, Rashi's commentary on the Chumash, 
is what he calls an explanation for a five-year-old that's looking how to read and understand the verses. Shuto Yishel Mikra, the simple explanation in the verse. In other words, it could be that there's better explanations if you want to get learned and, and intellectual. But if, I, if I'm not holding on that level, I'm just simple, give me the basic level, how do I understand the Torah? You look at Rashi. Now, we know this is just a, in, parenthetically, that the simplest ideas contain within it also the deepest ideas. So Rashi also has depth that's uh, unparalleled among the other commentaries, although you have to be very attuned and you have to be very uh, sharp in order to, uh, to, to, pick it, to pick it up. But the Rebbe, after his mother passed away in 1964, in September or October 1964, the Rebbe, every single Shabbos, began a new tradition. Every time, I shouldn't say every Shabbos, every time there was a Fabreng and every time he spoke, on the Shabbos, the Rebbe would introduce a Rashi and ask a number of questions on the Rashi. And then the Rebbe would introduce a Nav, he would bring from the previous commentaries trying to explain Rashi. And he would ask many questions on the commentaries and show how they, they're incorrect in explaining Rashi. And then the Rebbe would introduce his own novel idea in explaining this Rashi to understand it, which would answer all, all of the questions. So this is one of those times where the Rebbe asks a number of questions to understand what to understand Rashi. And the Rebbe comes to a final conclusion, and that is that there is a difference between clouds of glory and regular clouds. There are two separate things that we're referring to over here. The Jewish people had with them clouds of protection. The Jewish people had Anani HaKovit, clouds of glory. And we also had what just refers to as a regular cloud. Text 7a. Yossi, Bracha, does not thing. Okay, Shalom, 7a. There is a simple difference between just clouds and clouds of glory. The latter is to be understood literally. Namely, their entire purpose was to demonstrate the honor and glory of the Jewish people. In other words, there was no set of clouds whose purpose was to protect and provide the Jewish people with their basic needs. Though these clouds also demonstrated the Jews' honor, they weren't dedicated for that purpose. And then there was another set of clouds whose purpose was exclusively to demonstrate the Jews' honor, namely just how much God honors the Jewish people. So now we understand like this. God gave us clouds to protect us from the elements, to protect us from the enemies, to protect us from the wild animals, to flatten the land, to make it straight for us and easy to walk. Beautiful. In addition to that, there was another element. There's another cloud. And that was a special cloud just to show honor to the Jewish people. So although the first set of clouds also gave honor to the Jewish people, because after all, when you're going with a motorcade, it's going to be, it's, it's a way of traveling. The most honorable way of traveling is with a motorcade. So fine, good. But then in addition to that, that also was to protect you. You know, the presidential motorcade is not only to give him honor, but it's also to protect him. You got to make sure no one's going to hurt him. So imagine you have a full motorcade, and then after that, they send another layer of, of, of uh, I don't know, helicopters or whatever it is, which is not necessary for protection. It's just to give honor to the president. That's what Hashem did over here. Regular clouds of protection, and then additional clouds of glory. Anani HaKovit, the cloud that would give honor to the Jewish people. So now we can understand something very easily. When Aaron dies, what left the Jewish people? What, what was there in the merit of Aaron? His children. The, the cloud to protect the Jewish people, the clouds to give honor to the Jewish people. So the Rebbe is learning, based on when Rashi teaches us, that when Aaron died, the Anani Hakov, the clouds of glory, left. The second level of cloud, the clouds of glory, just to give honor to the Jewish people, and that was there only in the honor and the merit of Aaron. When Aaron died, those clouds left, that element left. But what remained? The protection remained. 
So therefore, if you're a Jew, what's there to complain about? You're going to go make a big ruckus because a, a level of honor was taken from you. Not a big deal, as long as we're still protected, right? We still have what we need. There's nothing disturbing our life now. So now we understand, according to the simple explanation, why the Jewish people did not complain after Aaron died when the clouds left, because there were still remaining clouds there to protect them. Whereas by the water, it was gone. There was nothing, there was no backup. There was nothing else. So therefore, they, therefore we complain. X 7b continued. The language used for the clouds that departed after Aaron's death is the clouds of glory departed. In other words, the only clouds that departed were those whose exclusive function was to demonstrate the Jews' honor, but not the clouds that provided the Jews with their basic needs. It was the clouds of glory that did not return. Accordingly, it is readily understood why the Jewish people didn't have any qualms about the clouds of glory as they did with Miriam's well. Okay, understood up until this point is understood, right? Any questions? No, we're good. Now we're going to show you like this, that everything we just said is true. That's all in explaining Rashi. But there's another way to learn. That is maybe the easier way to learn. Then it's a simpler, but maybe easier. And that is another reason why the Jewish people didn't complain. After the clouds of glory left. And not because there were two separate sets of clouds. No, there was only one set of clouds. Aaron died and the clouds left. But then something interesting happened. Text number eight, Simon. Rabbi Yosai, son of Rabbi Yehuda, says, three good sustainers rose up for the Jewish people during the Exodus from Egypt, and they are Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And three good gifts were given from heaven to their agency, and they are the well of water, the clouds of glory, and the manna. The well was given to the Jewish people in the merit of Miriam. The clouds of glory was in the merit of Aaron, and the manna in the merit of Moses. When Miriam died, the well disappeared. But the well returned in the merit of Moses and Aaron. When Aaron died, the clouds of glory disappeared, but the well and the clouds of glory returned in the merit of Moses. However, when Moses died, all of them disappeared, as it is stated, and I cut off the three shepherds in one month. But did the three shepherds really die in one month? Didn't Miriam die in the month of Nisan and Aaron and Ben Av and Moses and Abba? Rather, this verse teaches us that with the death, death of Moses, the three good gifts that were given to the agency were annulled, and all three gifts disappeared in one month, which made it seem as though all three leaders had died at the same time. Yossi, were you able to hear that? Yeah? Okay. I was making sure we could hear. On my end, it didn't show that there was uh, any uh, movement. Move this over here a little bit more. It was faint. Ah, huh? it was faint? Mm. Okay. But the idea was, the idea is you see clearly that Rabbi Huda teaches us like this. The well was in the merit of Miriam. The clouds were in the merit of Aram. The manna, the food, was in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. So the three things that we need to travel in the desert we had in the merit of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. The first one to pass was Miriam. So with Miriam went the well, no more water. But the water came back, as we discussed earlier through, through the story in the Parsha this week. In whose merit did the water come back? If, in other words, if to begin with, you needed to have a merit to have water. So why would God, and God said that merit is no longer there. So now why is it through the water returning? Because we're going to... Put it on, it will be dependent on Moses and Aaron, on their merit. Fine, return. Aaron dies, Moses is still there, so the water remains. But when Aaron dies, the clouds of glory was in his merit. So now there should be no clouds anymore. So what did he teach us? What did we just learn? So what happened? The clouds returned. Why did the clouds return? In the merit of 
Moshe Rabbeinu the Prize Return. So based on this, we understand now the answer to the question. The reason why the Jewish people didn't complain after the clouds, after Aaron died, because the clouds returned immediately. There was no process like what happened by the well. By the well, it stopped. They, com so they complained. They didn't see it coming. Then they had to go all story, touching the rock, hitting the rock, talking to the rock, striking the rock. But when it came to the clouds, it was immediate. There was no cessation ever. Or it left and it came back before they could even open their mouth. It already came back. So therefore, there wasn't ever a time when we were left vulnerable. So no reason to complain. This is the answer, but now we have to understand something that goes like this. What's the reason why Moses brought the month and Aaron brought the clouds of glory? What's the connection between Moses and month? Aaron and the clouds of glory. Aaron is a Kohen. Miriam and the air, Miriam and the well. We're not going to really talk about Miriam and the well right now. We'll talk about Moses and Aaron. That's going to be the focus of right now. Um, and once we understand why to begin with, why initially Aaron brought the clouds and Moses brought the manna, so then we can have the question, well, how did the manna is connected with Moses and clouds are with Aaron, so then how did the clouds come back in the miracle of motion? How did, how did this happen? So in order to understand this, we're going to differentiate a little nuance over here differentiate between the leadership of Moshe and the leadership of Aaron, or the role, we'll call it better, the role of Moshe and the role of Aaron in, in their, among the Jewish people. Aaron served as the high priest, but he also engaged with people. Moses served as the leader and the teacher, he also, he also engaged with people. Moses brings the mana. The mana, the mana is in the merit of Moshe. The food is in the merit of Moshe. The protective clouds are in the merit of Aaron. Let's understand for a moment first the mana. The mana was something that people ate. Food, you eat. Take it in. How much food does a person eat? People are different. People eat different amounts. In addition to how much food you're eating before you feel full, there's also, specifically when it came to man, something interesting. And that is text number nine. Yeah. The verse states, and when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. And it is written, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. And it is written, the people went about and gathered it. How can these texts be reconciled? For the righteous, the manna fell at the opening of their homes. They expended no effort at all. The average people went out of the camp and gathered what fell there. The wicked had to go about farther to gather. With regard to the manna, it is written bread, and it is written cakes, that is also written and grind it in the mills, implying that it was neither bread nor a cake. But how can these texts be reconciled? For the righteous, it fell as baked bread. For average people, it fell as unbaked cakes. For the wicked, it came in an unprocessed form, and consequently, they ground it in mills. So you see like this when it comes to the money. Food has to be rationed by person. Each individual needs a certain amount of food. So if I'm giving a family food, I need to give food per person, right? Water, drink is the same way. Specifically when it came to the man we see, that not only did the, is it food per person that a God had to give, but depending on what type of person you were, that's what type of delivery you got. Some people got delivery of ready to eat by their door. Some people had to go out and collect food from there, from the field. And some people had to travel all the way out of the camp and then they would only get the, the, or the ingredients. They would have to make it on their own. Depending on who you were, the more righteous, so then God would provide it for you in an easier fashion. So not only is it per person in terms of quantity, 
but there is also an element of specifically the mana that was per person. It was commensurate to what type of individual you are. That's what type of mana you received. It was very, in English, we'll call it personalized. Mana was personalized. Contrast that now with the clouds. Is there anything personal about the clouds of protection? Clouds of protection are one big booth, one big hut, one massive box that we lived in, a huge, huge box that there was absolutely nothing personal to any one individual about this protection. Everyone received it equal. You couldn't get more, you couldn't get less. You couldn't get closer, you couldn't get further, right? So this is the contrast that the Rebbe makes, text number 10, Mark David. The clouds of glory the Jews enjoyed in Aaron's merit possessed a certain quality that made them superior over the manna and the well the Jews enjoyed in the merit of Moses and Miriam, respectively. The manna was distributed with discretion and by ration, as the verse states, only an omer for each person. While the water from the well wasn't necessarily rationed, it still arrived to each person individually. By contrast, the clouds of glory associated with the Jewish people in an all-encompassing way, namely they indiscriminately surrounded and protected the entire Jewish nation. So now that we have these two ideas of the difference between the mana and the clouds, let's apply them now to the people in whose merit they arrived. The mana again was in the merit of Moshe. The clouds were in the merit of Aaron. Aaron. What was special about Aaron? What was Aaron's unique contribution to the Jewish people, to the Jewish nation? How did he interact with the Jewish nation? He, we find loved, huh? he loved peace. Oh. He was a lover and a pursuer of peace. Look at 11b. Hillel used to say, be a disciple of Aaron. Loving peace and pursuing peace, loving mankind and drawing them close to the Torah. We've, we've read this a number of times in different lessons. Talking about Aaron, what we can learn from Aaron. Aaron was a lover of peace and a pursuer of peace. Aaron was someone who always tried to make things good for people. He wanted everybody to, have to be in love. To, to, to every, every marriage should, should, should be successful. Every relationship should remain intact. And it's for this reason when Aaron dies, the men and the women cry over Aaron's loss because Aaron was there to make peace between everybody. When Moshe Rabbeinu dies, we only find the men cry. What you see from here is that Aaron's love, the idea of peace, that there should be peace among people, that's a general idea, it's a general concept. The world needs peace. The world needs love in order to function. Aaron was there pumping love. Aaron was there pumping peace. Aaron was there doing everything he possibly could to create an environment where everybody can get along. And because Aaron worked hard in creating this environment, so as an environment, Aaron was like the clouds of glory. He, tr he tried to create this, this, this bubble. He tried to create this security where anyone inside of this would, would be safe. Safe in terms of feeling love. Safe in terms of feeling peace. Moshe Rabbeinu, on the other hand, had a different role. Why did God choose Moshe Rabbeinu to be the leader? What the Mendes tells us, what did God see Moshe Rabbeinu do? That God said, ah, this is the type of person I want to lead my people. He was humble. He was a shepherd. He was a shepherd. So all the sheep were following they were walking, they were grazing, and one sheep ran off, wasn't feeling well. One sheep got sick, went its own way. What did Moshe Rabbeinu do? He followed the sheep. He followed it and nursed it back to what it needed to, to, to life, whatever it was, and he brought it back with everybody else. God said, this is the type of leader that I need for the Jews. Why? It's very simple. The Jewish people, they're a big, massive nation. They will all be going in a certain direction, right? There's going to be times when one person veers off to the right and one person veers off to the left. I can't have a leader who's just dealing with the masses. Where I, I don't have time to deal with individual because I'm, I'm running a country over here, right? I can't deal with, these, with this. Someone else take care of that. No. Moshe Rabbeinu was all about the individual. 
Much better was all about making sure everyone had what they specifically needed. That's what a teacher does. A teacher in the classroom, a good teacher, there's one type of teacher who gives information. If the student picked it up, you picked it up. If not, you're going to fail. What does a good teacher do? A good teacher makes sure every student knows. And if one is slower, if one is falling behind, you have to go and spend additional time with that student. A few more minutes after class. Make it easier for them. A, a, a teacher knows what to do. Moshe was Rabbeinu. Moses was our teacher. He was the master teacher. The master teacher deals with individual students. The master leader deals with individual people. His strength came from the individuals, Moshe Rabbeinu. Not because he was all en masse. He was dealing with the multitudes of people. So whereas Aaron was about creating a certain environment in the community, a general community environment of peace, of course, it, it affected everyone personally, but it was more about the community should be in peace and love. Moshe Rabbeinu was dealing with individual, personalized attention. He had to know. He was one man. It's only limited time in the day for everyone. But this is what we see about the great Jewish leaders coming down last Shabbos was Gimel Tammuz. Something you see from anybody that ever met the Lubavitch Rebbe will tell you he stood on Sunday, he gave dollars, a few thousand people would see him every single Sunday, and everyone will tell you, when you were standing in front of him, you felt like you were the only one. I there was 1,500 before you, and there was another 3,500 after you. doesn't matter. But for the two seconds that I was there, I felt that I was the only one. He addressed me and my needs. That's a Moshe Rabbeinu. That's what a Moshe Rabbein, that's what God saw by Moses. He saw every Jew who needed personalized attention. It can't be that one size fits all. It's impossible it's going to be one size fits all for all the Jews. It's not going to happen. There's going to be people that feel left out. There's going to be people that feel hurt. There's going to be people that feel incapable intellectually. Everyone has to be addressed. All, per, all problems all people have to be addressed in their own unique way. This is Moshe Rabbeinu. That's the month. That was the month. You got food per person and commensurate to what type of person you were. Certain people got this type of food, and certain people, type of people got that type of food. It was a Moses-like relationship, whereas the clouds of glory was more like a Aaron type relationship. So we, it makes sense now. This all makes sense. But now let's follow the story till the end. Aaron dies. Clouds disappear. But what do we learn now? They return, immediately return in the merit of Moshe. Well, how do you come back with Moshe? What's Moshe Rabbeinu's connection with clouds? He's all about the personalized attention, all about the individual. He's all about teaching every person. He's all about caring for every individual. Where does it come out? Do the clouds come back to Munch? We understand. What are the clouds? How does that come back to Moshe Rabbeinu? So here we learn some, something very fascinating, really, but not surprising. And that is something with what it says in Pirpi Yavis. This idea really, the mission says in Ethics of Our Fathers, the following teaching. In a place where there is no man, one should strive to be a man. In English, we say, we call it, in English, we call it, someone's got to step up to the plate. No one's doing it, right? So now what's going to happen? What happens now? Everyone can shrug their shoulders. Or, who? or someone's going to step up to the plate and say like this. What does it mean someone's going to step up to the plate? What it really means, when you think about it, is like this. The person who steps up to the plate, why did we need them to get up there to begin with? No one else was going. Why, why didn't they go to begin with? Why weren't they initially put in that position? It didn't really suit their, their capabilities from what we understood them. How it didn't, They didn't really feel comfortable in that situation, whatever it was. But now, because the situation called for it, therefore, they stepped up to the point. Moshe Rabbeinu, when he saw Aaron dies, and therefore Aaron and all that he stood for is gone, what's going to happen now? Everything's going to be, that's it. Chaos is going to ensue now. Now, that now we're not going to be engaging with, with marriages. We're not going to be engaging with peace and love anymore. 
That's not something for, for the Jews. That's a concept now that's a non-Jewish uh, behavior. To get, to get along is no longer a Jewish thing because Aaron's gone. Chas v'shom. God forbid. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, he's gone. I have to do it now. So Moshe Rabbeinu pivots. They with the new word that now everyone goes pivots. But he really, maybe you could say he transformed himself a little bit. He took on a whole nother burden, a whole nother uh, uh, um, Folder, what do they call it? The, uh, 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 the dimension. He changed how they practice. He, he had to. Yes, he had to. One hundred percent. He had to deal now with, 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 with the loss of Aaron. With that, I, with that, with the ideals that Aaron was engaging with, the, with his fellow Jews. Moshe Rabbeinu now had to be the one to, to, to engage with them on that level as well. He no longer was only the previous Moshe Rabbeinu, but he now had two roles to play. He played the role of Moshe and the role of Aaron. Not in the, not in the high priest side of, the, of Aaron's job. That was just a job of, of, of a representation in the, in the temple, that, not that part. But as it engaged with the people, he now took on that element, that new element as well. Let's read in the words of... Let's read it in the words of the Rebbe. Text 12. Whose turn is it? Part of the 12B. 12A. 12B. 12B. When Aaron and Miriam passed away, the clouds of glory and the well disappeared, yet they returned in Moses' merit. This can only mean that Moses pivoted and adopted a new approach. Moses' personal approach was that of a shepherd, congruent with the manna, yet he apparently adopted a new approach that was able to bring back the clouds of glory. What is the true sign of a real Jewish leader when he or she doesn't limit themselves to their own natural approach? Instead, when the hour demands it, they forego their personal preferences, put themselves aside, and dedicate themselves to the needs of another Jew. If the hour demands that another Jew be drawn closer to God, no matter how spiritually primitive they may be, a real Jewish leader sets their personal preferences aside and teaches another Jew the Aleph Bet. This can mean either the literal Aleph Bet or the Aleph Bet of simple Torah marriage. That is to say the basics. I'm like the high priest, so what, I, what am I doing in a cemetery? Others might say. Still others might say, I'm an advanced Torah scholar, so why do I need to busy myself with returning a lost object whom the Talmud states is exempt from such activities? This is beneath my dignity. It's just not my thing. I'm a leader, and my thing is to instruct other leaders on how to lead the Jewish nation. I certainly have no business coming in contact with people of questionable religious scruples. Moses was not like that. When Aaron and Miriam passed away and there was no one left to tend to the matter, the leader of the Jewish people himself turned his attention to the matter and dealt with it, even if it wasn't necessarily befitting his dignity. And this is the lesson that we have to walk away with today. Because we all have our thing, and then there's a lot of things, a whole bunch of stuff which are not our thing, which we say, yeah, nice, good, you got, you could do it. But it's not really my cup of tea. It's not really my style. We say it all the time. Not my type. But Moshe Rabbeinu was able to remarkably transform himself and teach us that when someone else needs it, you have to make it your business to do what it takes to make it happen. 12C will read, Dr. Debra writes in Tanya that every Jew possesses a spark of, Moshe, of Moses. What does that mean, every Jew? What does every Jew mean? It means every Jew. It means no one is, is excluded. Thus, his behavior contains a message for us all. We all have our things. When Miriam's well and Aaron's clouds disappear, 
now there's danger from snakes and scorpions, you are now responsible to do whatever you can to bring them back, even if it's not your thing. Now you might say, I don't need to be concerned about the snakes and the scorpions. I wear my godly image on my sleeve, so I'm protected, as the Gemara says, a wild animal does not have power over a person unless that person seems to be, seems to the wild animal like an animal. As it's stated, he is like the beast that perish. Banish such thoughts, says the Rebbe. Someone else is in danger and quite possibly they do not have an Aram or a Miriam looking out for them. This is a matter of life and death and it would warrant desecrating the Shabbos for even the slightest chance of rescue. And so you, yes, you, must be the one to ensure that another person has everything they need, be it mana, clouds, and or water. We cannot ever say that this is not something for me. This is not a Jewish way. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher, taught us that yes, there are roles for the Jewish people. There are certain organizations that take care of this and certain organizations that take care of that. Certain rabbis have this role to play and certain community activists have the other roles to play. There's a lot of different machines and a lot of different roles, a lot of different people, a lot of different things in this big organism called the Jewish nation. But when there's an opportunity, someone needs something, and they're not finding help elsewhere, and it's not something that I usually engage with because it's not something I'm comfortable with, not something I have experience with, whatever it is. We learn from this week's parsha how Aaron isn't there, I got to be the arm. My responsibility to try to help them out. Get over myself, move a little bit out of my comfort zone, and extend myself, extend myself to them in their time of need. That's the call of the hour. That's what it means to step up to the plate. Allah Moshe Rabbeinu. Anyone have any questions today? Comments? Yossi?